All right, great. Thank you, everybody, for coming out on a beautiful Tuesday night. Uh, it was great to see so many RSVPs. I think it was the most number of RSVPs, but maybe also the most drop-off. It's such a beautiful day. Um, uh, so I'm not going to uh, say too much other than just to introduce uh, who our first three guests are. This is our fifth uh, UC Berkeley Cloud Computing Meetup, and we'll talk a little bit about why we have to meet up. Uh, but our first speaker is uh, Ira Tarshis, who is a cloud services architect at uh, UC Davis, and he's going to talk about uh, controlled unclassified information, CUI, uh, that's part of NIST 800-171, and there's a lot of security people in the audience, I can tell. Um, so that'll be the first talk, and then we're going to hear from Pavan Gupta, uh, who's a digital health engineer uh, working at UCSF. So we're, it's, it's the summer, so I think we're widening out and we're including other parts of the UC uh, in this, which is pretty great. Uh, so he's deployed a HIPAA-compliant research environment, he's going to talk about that. Uh, and then our third speaker is the head of product for Kiwi Campus, uh, that is Sasha Yatsenia, if I think I got that right. And so he's going to talk about how they use different cloud providers to do different types of tasks, because uh, they have machine learning that they use to train the sort of mostly autonomous uh, robots. Uh, that deliver food on the Berkeley campus and that you, if you're around campus, I guarantee you've seen them. So I wanted to thank our sponsors. Uh, so Carolyn Wynette uh, is the executive director of the Skydeck. She couldn't be here today, but I'm going to briefly hand the microphone uh, to Gordon Peng. He's a program coordinator here at the Skydeck and responsible for all the logistics and helping us get this set up. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Gordon. Uh, I'm the program coordinator here at Skydeck. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, it's Please enjoy uh, our, our space. Uh, we host this every uh, last Tuesday of the month. And what we do is we are uh, UC Berkeley's own startup accelerator. Um, and we have a fund component to the accelerator that contributes half of the ultimate carry uh, when there's an exit of any startup back to the campus itself. So it's an ecosystem that drives not only entrepreneurs, at Berkeley and across the UC system, but also has this feedback loop going on to gener generate more revenue for uh, not only the university, but also for, for future endeavors, especially in the entrepreneurship space. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me as well regarding that. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, so I also want to thank all of the co-organizers that help us out in, the, in getting this set up. So Amy Nieser from Research IT, uh, Jason Christopher, also from Research IT, uh, Anthony uh, Suen, my partner here in crime today from the Division of Data Sciences. Uh, Catherine Carson is also one of our sponsors for the Data Science Initiative, along with Jen Stringer in the back, our deputy CIO for campus. Uh, and I'm going to have Catherine come up and say a few words, uh, and then we'll talk about why we're actually doing the Cloud Meetup. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Um, as you see, there's a coalition of partners who are bringing together the Cloud Meetup. And just speaking on behalf of all of them, I wanted to make sure that the spirit of inclusion and welcoming to people with all kinds of technical backgrounds, all kinds of concerns, and all kinds of places, you know, sitting in all kinds of places on their learning curve is something that you feel as you come into this room. Because it's really important for all of us, and I speak here in the role as the faculty lead, for the last two years of our undergraduate data science program to have everyone feel that they can get the benefits of cloud computing, new technologies, the capacities that we can now run on the cloud to make things easier for whatever areas we're working in. So this, this notion that is expressed in the meetups, in the um, patient materials, the experience that we want you to have in the room here is one of collective learning and sharing information and everyone feeling like they're welcome to contribute and welcome to question. Um, I can speak a little bit also about the kinds of ways that we've tried to embody this spirit in the new division of data science and information, which has been formally um, set up starting July 1st, and which will come into being as the kind of emergent, inclusive academic space for everything connecting to computing and data and society across UC Berkeley. And so standing here as one of the team of faculty and staff and students who have built the division, I want to express that special welcome to those of you who are coming from outside UC Berkeley 
and who are feeling that this might be a place for you to do the learning and the contributions that you feel you have particularly to contribute to this process of not just technological, but also social and even organizational change. The division itself is an emergent thing, as I mentioned, and so I won't bore you with the details of how it's actually possible to build an organization if you see Berkeley that includes the words quantum superposition and its work <laughs> chart. If you're interested about that, come talk to me afterwards. But just say the spirit of, we will find a way, we will figure out how to connect to each other and share what we have and learn from each other is fundamental to the mission of the new division and to share it with all of the partners who put together the cloud meetup. So with that spirit of inclusion and also of innovation that comes from bringing those different voices in, I want to welcome you and then pass the microphone back once again to have the introduction to the session itself. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so one thing that I, I always wanted to address, you know, sort of at the beginning is why, because I get asked this, you know, why are we having a cloud meetup? Um, and you know, I kind of view that the answer is in the room. So we've done a poll at the beginning of every session, and what we've found is we end up with about a third, a third, a third between IT staff, academics, and people from startups and the outside community. And one of the things that's, I think, part of the spirit of inclusion is bringing everybody together to break down walls and silos and have people share information. And it was great, and the video will be posted soon once we caption it. Um, from last time, someone watching the video said this reminded them of a graduate seminar. There was one particular place where someone was trying to solve a research problem, and a bunch of people from all over the place helped them solve that problem. Uh, and I think it was relating to Globus and moving data around. Uh, so um, I'm going to just do the quick poll again. How many of you here are academics on the academic side of the university? So. Three and a half. <laughs> it's the summer. How many are IT staff? Okay, a large number of IT staff this time. And how many of you are from the community or from startups? So we have probably eight, nine, maybe ten altogether. All right, thank you. Um, so, uh, as one of the other things that we usually do is, wanted to take a moment and for you to, because it's a meet up. I uh, wanted you to turn to the person next to you or on either side and talk about why you're here tonight. We'll give you a couple minutes to introduce yourselves and then we'll come back and we'll start the talks. Thanks. Thanks, Mom. Um, yeah, so uh, like Bill said, my name's Ira Tarshis. Uh, I'm from UC Davis. Uh, I do cloud systems engineering, development, architecture, um, a bunch of cloud stuff within our central IET organization. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm here today to talk about a, a NIST 800-171 compliant cloud environment that we built last year. Um, so on top of some other stuff that I do, this was something that I worked on for my first year at UC Davis. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, sort of a cross-functional, cross-team effort. Um, and so I'm going to go through you know how we built it a lot of the sort of administrative hurdles that we went through to get it to get it set up and uh, and then go through some of the technical architecture we have um, and hopefully it's interesting um, and if it's not hopefully the view makes up for it <laughs> <laughs> all right so we'll get started so this is an agenda uh, mostly a pointless slide but that's what's going to happen um, so uh, the our secure research computing environment, our NIST 800-171 environment, we uh, nicknamed SOURCE, uh, which stands for Secure Research Computing Environment, because we're super creative people. Um, so uh, it's, as I mentioned, a NIST 800-171 compliant environment. We recently got a third-party attestation at the end of the year last year. Um, it's entirely deployed in Amazon Web Services, so it's a, a cloud-native, well, sort of. It's, a, it's cloud infrastructure, anyway. Um, and we did this as sort of a shared effort between my department, the departmental IT group, and our CISO's ISO office, uh, information security office on campus, um, and then a bunch of researchers who did pilot testing and are our clients, basically, for this project. <clears throat> um, we were approached by a research team who really triggered the, were the impetus for doing this uh, back before I even uh, joined UC Davis, 
they came to the ISO's office asking for an environment where they could do research on controlled unclassified information. Basically, uh, they had been presented by data providers with a contract or a liability con waiver asking them to assume liability for CUI that they were going to do research on and telling them that they would be fined some tremendous amount of money uh, if it was discovered that they were not using a NIST 800-171 compliant environment. Um, so they approached uh, the ISO office and central IT to help them do that with and sort of assume some of the uh, technical overhead and security and administrative overhead of doing that um, because they didn't have the, the resources to invest in, in the operational overhead of becoming compliant, basically. Um, so the challenge was we needed an environment that could provide secure handling of CUI, offer researchers something that they were familiar with that was a low barrier to entry for them where they could run the tools that they're used to running uh, against the data uh, without a whole lot of new training or, or education. Um, we also needed to limit our IT support footprint uh, because we have limited resources um, in the central team that I work in. Uh, and so uh, <clears throat> we needed one, help from the ISO's office to produce all the, uh, the tons of documentation that we needed for this, and we needed something that we could support with minimal IT staff. Um, and the idea at the end of all this was that we would get a third-party attestation to compliance with NIST 800 so that researchers could feel comfortable assuming the liability for the data that we're storing in the cloud. Um, yeah. So um, to scope the project, we sort of uh, created a cross-functional team. So we have we had volunteers who really needed this type of research environment immediately from the College of Engineering, uh, a professor Frank Loge who works on um, water energy efficiency research uh, at the College of Engineering appro approached us and wanted to sort of beta test and pilot test the project and has been incredibly supportive during that time. Um, Cheryl Washington, our, our um, Chief Information Security Officer and her office and members of her team were uh, instrumental in creating the documentation and reviewing the NIST standards to make sure we were meeting them as well as providing sort of audit support throughout the process. And then Campus IT, my team, which is sort of the central IT organization of the campus, um, we had usually on this project one full-time staff plus maybe some assistants working on it and we assumed the brunt of the technical implementation. Um, and then we had some departmental IT assistance from the College of Engineering's IT group, uh, which was also instrumental in getting this done. Um, we wanted a, a really secure and flexible environment, um, and uh, a narrow scope for our audit purposes was really important. We didn't have a lot of staff to build it, so shrinking it down to a size that was easily auditable and isolated from all our other stuff was really important. And so we chose a public cloud provider um, and we went with Amazon Web Services, partially because that's where the expertise lied, partially because they offer a bunch of services for doing compliance and uh, have excellent support, and also um, because they, had, they were more mature at the time um, when, we, when we went into this endeavor. So uh, why we chose to put this in the cloud, um, one, the, probably the primary reason is that it's easy to limit the scope by putting a data center in the cloud. Our environment uh, exists as a very small, sort of isolated environment with its own domain and its own network infrastructure, and I'll talk about that in a bit. And it was really easy to do this by putting it in the cloud. That way, you're not connected to any of your on-prem stuff. You don't bring a bunch of physical security in, in, into scope, and your campus data center kind of stays out of scope. And as you'll see in a minute, uh, AWS actually assumes a lot of sort of, they, they provide us a lot of things to cover the compliance workload. Um, we also uh, needed to, to, to build something that we could automate and replicate very easily and be sure that when we were doing new deployments or when new projects came on board, we were consistently deploying things uh, in a manner that like ensured the security configurations were, were set up the way we wanted them. And that is much easier to do in the cloud than it is on-prem at least in my experience, and it also matches my background a bit better. Um, so uh, the going to the cloud ended up actually providing us with quite a bit uh, in terms of value. 
So NIST 800-171, uh, for folks who aren't familiar, is basically a security control with uh, 14 control families. So these security standards are basically typically drafted with control families, and then within the control families, there's controls that they can either be prescriptive or they can be sort of generalized. In the case of NIST 800-171, it's, they're fairly generalized. They don't prescribe technical solutions. They say things like, uh, you know, be sure to provide an access control and identification system. Okay, so um, they range in, uh, in, in how they're characterized and what the categories are from like physical protection, media protection, to access control and identity management. They even have some standards around awareness and training for personnel, that kind of thing. Um, when we went to AWS, one of the things that we noticed was a lot of the control families no longer apply to what the work we were doing. Um, so what I did here is just to do some math to, to demonstrate this. Um, I took the 111 NIST 800-171 controls. Uh, we have to create a system security plan. That's just something you have to do when you're getting audited. And the system security plan is basically a control, then the responsible party, and then how you address that control. And so I took them and I did some math on them and basically what came out was that AWS satisfies about 23% of our security controls. Um, so for instance, like physical security, we don't even think about it really because it's mostly covered by AWS. We can download the attestations that they have through their auditors and present them to, you know, um, to our auditor, basically. Um, media protection is another one, but basically a number of these controls are either serviced partially by AWS or they have services that are assisting us um, in, in addressing them, um, so that was a big help. Um, and then the rest of it, the other close to two thirds of it um, is broken down like you see in the chart here. So Central IT, my organization handles about 60% of the, the compliance workload, ISOs about nine, and then departmental IT is about 10. So that's kind of how the breakdown was for us in terms of the cross-functional work that needed to be done. Um, and most of that stuff is documentation. So to meet the security requirement, um, and the com compliance requirement, we had about half the work was creating documentation, then about 35% of it was following processes and making sure the processes were documented uh, and making sure we documented our execution of the processes in the proper way. Um, and then about 15% of it was my job, which is you know the easy part, which was the technology and the technological implementation. So really, I think meeting these security standards, people maybe sometimes think that uh, it's a big technical thing, um, but actually the technical part is the easy part. The rest of it is what's really difficult uh, for someone like me anyway, who's primarily technical. Um, so with that said, I'm the technical guy, not the documentation guy. So I'm gonna talk about the technical implementation and, uh, and yeah. <laughs> um, so my boss really likes this slide because it's sort of uh, inventories all of the, the stuff that is involved in source. So you can see there's some documentation components there. We have policies and standards. It's about over, I would say, 450 pages of documentation the last time I looked that have been reviewed and, and assessed over and over again, and we turn them all over to the auditor and stuff. Um, and then, uh, and that includes policies, standards, oper standard operating procedures, research unit handbooks for the research units that are our customers, and then our SSP. Um, and then we have a bunch of server components. I'm going to talk about those a bit later. But the big thing in the middle is all the AWS components we use. So AWS provides a ton of managed services for compliance and obviously you run networks in AWS and things. So this is sort of the list of AWS services that right now in the current state of the environment we're making use of. I'd say the big ones for, from a compliance perspective are Amazon Guard Duty, AWS Config, uh, CloudWatch, CloudTrail, AWS Inspector, those kinds of things. Um, and then automation is a crucial component of our system, and I'll talk that, about that in a bit, but um, the key takeaway here is we basically use Terraform for everything, and I highly recommend it. Um, so the way we got started technically is we used um, Amazon's uh, quick start architecture for NIST. So they have a quick start architecture that covers NIST 853 and NIST 800-171, which is a subset of NIST 853. Um, and uh, that quick start architecture is basically a collection of CloudFormation strip scripts, pretty turnkey for people who are fluent in CloudFormation. You basically upload these specifications and AWS does all the work to deploy your infrastructure. 
works pretty well. Um, then we ended up modifying the, the baseline architecture um, a fair amount for, for our needs, but it, it, it provided a good starting point. And one of the other useful things for NIST, anyway, was uh, AWS provides a security controls matrix, which is basically a spreadsheet that lists all the compliance uh, controls and then how the AWS Quick Start architecture satisfies them. So it gives you a little bit of a roadmap or a taste for how you're going to have to technically address the security control standards. Uh, and I believe it, it covers both 853 and 800171. I think they have these for FedRAMP and uh, FISMA, various other things. Um, so in order to enhance and solve some of the problems we saw with um, the AWS Quick Start architecture, we looked at other universities that were doing NIST 800-171 compliant research environments in the cloud, and Purdue sort of uh, popped up as one of those. Um, basically, Purdue had developed in 2016 what they called the data airlock model, which was an infrastructure-based uh, SFTP airlock for getting data into the system and getting it out of the system. And I'm gonna go through how we sort of implemented that idea uh, a little bit later, but that was something we adapted from Purdue's EDUCAUSE article, which is linked down there. It's probably outdated now. I think they do something different. Um, I know we do, uh, but they published it originally in 2016. Um, and so this is what we ended up coming up with. I'm gonna go through the architecture a bit more detail in a second, but basically we have a multi-account structure. So when new researchers come on board or new research projects come on board, we deploy a new AWS account for them. And that account is linked back to our master management account and the security account through IAM roles and VPC peering um, along, you know, so we have network connectivity and we have IAM role uh, permissions connectivity. So AWS sort of um, IAM access to deploy our uh, infrastructure and things like that. Um, we have consolidated billing, which is one of the major things that at our university anyway has been an issue is people, it's kind of difficult to pay with PO and invoicing through AWS, so we consolidate billing and charge back to the project accounts that are onboarded into our environment. <coughs> um, and then uh, we, we have network controlled through the VPC flow architecture and we deploy this stuff through Terraform, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, so yeah, I'll just talk about each of these accounts sort of individually. In the security account, we have a single VPC. Um, in that VPC, we have third-party applications, Splunk and Sophos. Uh, Splunk is used as our primary logging, monitoring, and compliance auditing service. So we lean very heavily on Splunk in this environment. Um, it's really customizable for folks who use Splunk. It's really expensive, um, and <clears throat> but it does it does a lot of the things we need and is sort of a catch-all solution for us. Uh, we use a bunch of AWS native solutions as well that run out of the security account. So Guard Duty, which uh, is an AWS service that provides sort of a, a perimeter de uh, threat detection layer, I guess, on AWS. So if malicious IPs are trying to access your environment through any public interfaces you have, Guard Duty checks for that. If there's abnormal activity within IAM on your accounts, Guard Duty will alert on that. AWS Config is a semi-customizable AWS compliance enforcement service. So it has visibility on AWS's like network architecture, so security groups, firewall rules, firewall ACLs, and your network configuration can all be sort of audited using uh, AWS Config. Uh, additionally, you can audit things like are backups occurring, do you have public S3 buckets, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, CloudTrail is uh, what we use for audit logging, so anytime a change is made in AWS, we log it to a specific place and run a report every you know, week on <clears throat> what changes were made within the environments uh, using CloudTrail. And then we're monitoring VPC flow logs for how traffic is flowing through the system between the private VPCs and, um, and out to the public if, if that happens. Um, we have a management account where all our identity and access management infrastructure lives. So right now we're using Active Directory as our identified identity and access management service. It lives in a private subnet. Um, and we also run um, Systems Manager and AWS Inspector out of this account to scan for vulnerabilities on the different uh, servers that are running within our environment. Um, and we also route all network traffic outbound to the internet through this management uh, management uh, account so that we can control 
you know, how, what kind of traffic's going on, where people are browsing, that kind of thing. Uh, and then finally, we have our project or client accounts. So like I said, each research project gets its own account. Um, they get a single VPC, and we deploy some basic infrastructure within that VPC. We deploy an egress airlock and an ingress airlock server, as well as a terminal server. So the ingress airlock is how they get data in, egress airlock is how they take data out, and then the terminal server is where they land to sort of move that data into their uh, research clusters, which live in a private VPC. So they have the ability to deploy systems into a private VPC and configure them there, but they route all their traffic through a terminal server. Uh, additionally, when researchers are onboarded, we give them access to their own SSL VPN tunnel uh, using um, Pulse VPN, and they, that is how they get access to their terminal server. So they need to log into the VPN, we have two factors set up on that, and then they access their terminal server via RDP, and they can put things into the airlocks via SFTP or take them out via SFTP. Um, yeah, the crucial component of these um, client environments is the airlock design. So the airlocks are basically running on Amazon Linux AMIs right now, unfortunately, and we have a number of um, we have a number of you know uh, Linux-based Active Directory binding technologies that we use to bind them to Active Directory so that we manage authentication centrally. Um, and you know, with some other security things, we use CIS benchmarking AMIs and uh, everything is encrypted at uh, FIPS compliant encryption on our SSH and SFTP services. Um, and basically this is the workflow for, for each of the airlocks. So the ingress airlock, um, basically a, a, a researcher would log in through their SSL VPN tunnel. They would then have access to a SFTP drop location. When they drop their data in there, it's scanned through Sophos, logged to Splunk, and then, and then made available through a Samba share on their terminal server. Uh, to get data out, we have an approval process. So uh, a, a researcher would put something into an outbound SFTP airlock. It would trigger an approval workflow, and an authorized approver would have to review what was in the airlock, approve it for egress, or or not approve it, in which case it's deleted. And then once it's approved for egress, it gets put onto a, a public SFTP endpoint where the researcher can pull it off through the VPN tunnel. Um, this is all sort of deployed and provisioning is done using Terraform. So we have a version state um, of the environment and we have versions, um, versions of the Terraform scripting and specification in Bitbucket and then a system for having Terraform pull versions of that um, of, the, of the environment and deploy it. So when we add a new project VPC, we make a new, we, we specify new, a new project VPC in the Terraform uh, configuration and it gets deployed via Terraform's execution model. And so we use it to deploy all our network infrastructure. So basically every VPC and every account is consistent in terms of network configuration, in terms of the servers that exist there, what their configurations look like, and, um, and all the peering and IAM access roles within the accounts. Um, yeah, some lessons learned. Um, so I, I think we, over, we underestimated the time required. So this project took about two years, um, which uh, I think my boss told me one time he thought it was gonna take a month before <laughs> I started. So I think, I think we sort of went into this without all of the understanding of what meeting a security compliance standard entails. As I mentioned earlier, it's about 450 pages of documentation, which takes more than a month to write and more than you know, one or two people to review over the course of time. Um, it also costs a lot more than we thought. Uh, dev environments cost a lot of money. AWS will let you deploy a lot of resources into their accounts before they before you hit a roadblock and they can get very expensive over time. So doing a cost assessment early and a real practical cost assessment that looks at what you're gonna spend for dev environments and test environments and how long you're gonna run in production before you start getting recouping money and costs from your clients is a good, good thing to do. Um, I think the other technical takeaway I have is use automation early. So I think our environment was initially built by hand or through modifications to CloudFormation deployed architectures and then we had to go through the painful task of retroactively uh, specifying all of that stuff in automation and getting it to work again after doing that. 
Um, that costs a lot of time, and it's tempting to go into the console and just deploy things and, and spin things up, because it's very easy, it's a nice console to use, but uh, I would encourage never doing that and only putting stuff into your, to your automation code, because it, it really saves time in the future, um, and it makes, you, makes it much easier to iterate on things. Um, yeah, so but the future, um, so this summer, a couple projects that we're working on is um, we're working on cost optimizations, so we want to make things more elastic, utilize S3 more for storage instead of EBS block storage on the servers. Uh, we want to implement spot instances and more um, sort of auto scaling within our environment and more time-based or need-based scaling up and down of the systems within the environment. Right now, everything is very static. Researchers deploy the research systems they need and they spend the money, whether it's the weekend, whether it's a holiday, whenever. Uh, we want to make it so that it's need-based when they get those services. Uh, we're also looking to optimize the airlocks and make them more cloud-native um, using a combination of Lambda, S3, Cognito, and ADFS. So this solution involves a Lambda front end, an API basically, that puts sys files and, and data into S3. It's then scanned and we use Cognito and an ADFS link to our um, to our source domain, to our uh, secure domain to uh, authenticate users. That is mostly built at this point and hopefully will be rolled out soon and we'll get away from using servers for the airlocks and then moving away from Splunk because it's expensive and hard to maintain. Um, and then some other cloud initiatives. This is mostly selfish because uh, I want people to come up to me and tell me how to do these things. Um, <laughs> these are things we're working on currently. Uh, on our campus. So one of them is building a data lake. Um, one of the things we've done so far is automate the ingestion of structured and unstructured data, um, cataloging it using glue, putting it into S3, and then using Athena to provision connections to various systems using JDBC and ODBC connectors. Um, that's something that's in the works right now, and we're working on building systems to get data, mostly diverse systems to get that diverse types of data into S3. And the other thing we're working on is cloud, a cloud brokerage initiative, which is basically a way of deploying AWS accounts, adding them to an inventory database, and configuring them for billing recharge. Um, and that uses Lambda, RDS, IAM, IDP, and ADFS. And we configure them with single sign-on through our domain with ADFS when we do that. Um, so those are sort of the two initi other initiatives I'm working on right now. Um, and that's it for me. Anybody have questions? I'm wondering how you pay for this. Is this a recharge service? Not yet. <laughs> uh, so, so right now, um, right now we are charging cost to our clients, and that just happened. Um, up until last October when we got the attestation, uh, I believe the provost was putting the bill. I don't know, somebody, not me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, we're not recharging. Yeah. So along those same lines, how are you shutting people down when the projects are done? Is that an automated mechanism for that or do they have to notify you? Um, so they notif there's not an automated mechanism currently. A lot of this, so the cloud brokerage project that I talked about briefly at the end, is going to be driven through ServiceNow forms for provisioning app, uh, accounts and then deprovisioning accounts. And so that is something we're looking at using to deprovision these services. But right now they notify us and we tear it down using Terraform archive data if they need it. Um, but usually they say they're done with everything. So. And when a researcher signs up, do they get a select amount of bandwidth from AWS or do you allow bursting within accounts or are you able to share that resource in, among several researchers? So one of the things we can do is share re uh, reserved instances across the account, the sub accounts in the org, but that's about it right now in terms of cost optimization. One of the things we're working on right now is being able to burst to spot instances as needed for the capacities of the research application that's running, uh, but that automation work has sort of just started and so we're trying to provision that stuff now. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you know if there are any plans down the road to open this up as a service to other campuses? <laughs> um, yeah, way down the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yes, there is there is some discussion about that, but um, yeah. You can come up to my chat later. Yeah. <laughs> 
So just on 800, 171, do you feel that meets the needs of most researchers? Because like a challenge that we have is people come to us with very different compliance requirements. Yeah. And is that like a bar that's a pretty good level where you can accommodate most people? Um, I think I think it would be better if we had some more DFARS compliance, like NIST 853 is probably, I would say, uh, more of a generalized standard. I think a lot of our researchers and the researcher who came to us initially um, are looking at CUI, uh, working with CUI, so this really fits their need. But uh, some other researchers that we talked to and just talking to researchers around campus, 853 seems like the sort of a, a standard that we could potentially bring in a lot more customers using. And so I think we're looking at sort of moving towards that, that, that kind of compliance. Yeah. Once we optimize things for usability, because right now it's kind of, uh, we got a lot of feedback from researchers during UAT that things are a little bit difficult to use, so we're, we're making optimizations there. I think that's all the time we have for questions. We can go for later, but Hello, uh, so I'm Pavan Gupta. I'm a digital health engineer with the Center for Digital Health Innovation. And uh, I'm going to do this quickly, I think. So I thought maybe it would be fun to offer four sort of opinionated thoughts about how uh, you would consider using cloud computing. And I will pivot around a fancy technology called Kubernetes. And if you're not familiar with that, it's uh, essentially a stateful orchestration tool for uh, sort of container and cloud native. Environments. Let's get this thing going. All right. So, uh, Ira just did a great job describing a fantastic Amazon environment. It turns out we also at UCSF embarked on a version of that. Um, in the end, our researchers basically wanted a console. They wanted that console to be simple. They wanted to log in. They wanted to do their work. And that was it. In fact, oh, yeah, here we go. Can you hear me a little better now? Hello. <laughs> Okay, so they wanted something very simple, and they wanted it to be uh, usable. The problem was, uh, as it turns out, Amazon is a particularly expensive tool, and in certain scenarios, it works a lot, lot better than other scenarios. So I come from a research group, um, and it turns out there may be better solutions to considering this. So here is the first opinion I have. I think there's a better way to think about cloud computing. So there is a, I, I stole that image, by the way, from Microsoft. I, I, yeah, she just stole it from Amazon, I'll steal it. Don't worry, Matt Jameson. Um, so to be clear, there is a notion that the world has kind of been going from things that look like you know, on-premise implementations into sort of fancy cloud-based implementations. And a lot of the cloud-native tooling is starting to return to data centers everywhere. Um, it's actually really exciting. It means that you can sort of operate uh, IT services as if they were just consumable APIs, and it offers a number of game-changing options. So, um, one, it's worth noting that if you're a grant-funded researcher, I thought I a couple academics in the room, um, yeah, you don't want your machines to just go away at the end of the day. Right? You want to be able to have something you can continue to use. Um, like I said, cloud native is pretty interesting. Um, and it turns out it's possible to bu build on-prem infrastructure in really thoughtful cloud native ways. Um, in fact, I think this research platform is doing that the best across the University of California, as far as I can tell. Um, and we are certainly implementers of what they're doing. Um, and I want you to take this away from this slide. The better way to think about cloud computing is that it's a mechanism for agility. It's not necessarily a mechanism for all compute. So uh, in doing that, uh, I think I was introduced to the guy who was doing HIPAA-related secure research. Um, at some point, August 22nd, we will be presenting in Santa Clara, at least briefly, about a, a NIST 853 exercise that we're busy going through, which, goodness gracious, it's, uh, it's surprisingly boring. Um, but it's about to show that we can do cool, sort of cloud-native things with high-performance computing using stuff that, I'm told, Singularity was built somewhere up on the hill over there, so we're, we're implementing that. But one of the things that comes with it is sort of this new notion of sort of zero trust. So if you talk to security nerds, they're all about this thing called zero trust. And so zero trust is basically the idea that up and down, this, so let me first say, and I don't think there's any UCSF people in the room, so pretend like I didn't say it, but uh, yeah, maybe our internal and external networks are no longer trustworthy. Um, there's probably good reasons why they are trustworthy, but let's just assume they're not. Um, it turns out 
researchers engaging in synchronous security controls is probably a mistake. That's not their expertise. It's probably not where they want to spend their time. Um, and frankly, nobody really wants to clean up the mess afterwards. Um, and so this, there's this notion that if you isolate all the way up to the, all the way up the stack, right? So you have isolation layer after isolation layer after isolation layer. There's potentially a way of thinking about those isolation layers as, as security by design, right? So let's say I'm just doing a very simple thing. Um, I can explain this beautiful picture, which by the way I also stole from Silasp.com. Who knows what that is? Um, but the point is, if you if you're thinking about things that look like users, application, do the data and the network, and everything is sort of encapsulating each other, maybe in order for you to escape your isolation, right, in order for there to be a chain of events that leads to a security problem, uh, you really have to go tackling one isolation layer after another. Um, you know, to be clear, it's still possible, but it's, it's harder as you sort of maintain each isolation layer. So what I want you to take away from that is maybe there's a new way to sort of think about how you can isolate your workloads. Keep your secure stuff deep inside far away corners that are attached in, in like well secured container platforms that attach to secured VMs and attach to secured hardware that are attached to isolated SDNs and software defined networks and you know have those things riding even more isolated host networks. There's a lot of ways to think about that. Um, and so think about zero trust. Um, I'll explain why I think that's a why that's important here in a second. Um, and so the next big takeaway is this. I think that you can build your cloud solution on-prem. And in fact, if you aren't building it on-prem, you might be doing it wrong. So we have, uh, I haven't defined what Alice is. Uh, it's unfortunate I deleted some slides from this because <laughs> I thought I had like five minutes to talk. Um, Alice is, I think, the artificial learning and intelligence compute environment. That's what the Center for Digital Health Innovation is using now for uh, a slew of machine learning research. Um, which is kind of cool, actually. This is the implementation for us. So I, a strong shout out to people that are doing this better than us in the Pacific Research Platform and then across the UCs. Um, but it turns out, so there's a lot caught up in this slide, but let me, let me just explain. We are running a small supercomputer within our sort of research environment. That research environment is designed to be easily accessible. Um, and it's turned out that actually the easily accessible part is coming true. Uh, researchers don't have to be extremely sophisticated to be able to use extremely sophisticated sort of data science pieces. Um, but it turns out it's actually very hard to run Kubernetes in a successful way. Um, and it requires significant expertise. Um, and it turns out it's nice to have people within the UC system that have that expertise. Um, and believe me, we're stealing some of that expertise. Um, but it turns out things are getting better and they're getting better faster. Um, the Kate's community, the Kubernetes community, is actually quite large. And like I've said a million times, the UC version of that community is extremely strong. In fact, I think at the University of California, Berkeley, you guys are running one of the most impressive sort of Jupyter Hub implementations uh, maybe in the world. So, and I think you are also hosting some of the genius behind it. Uh, and, uh, and like I said, it's just an enjoyable user experience. And it turns out researchers probably don't care what, the, well, unless they are researching security problems, they don't care about the security, they care about the, the end use. Okay, so I wanted, you to, I wanted to end with this, and I, I don't have a, a way for me to just prescribe the solution, but I've taken you down a path where I've said, maybe the version of the cloud that we've been talking about for at least the two years that I've been around, and certainly the years before that, should be rethought. Right, the cloud is a tool that lets you sort of expand and contract, but it's not the fundamental place where you do your compute. Right, I told you that you should be thinking about how you can isolate things in that case of security, and I told you it looks like Kubernetes is the is a is a viable and workable solution with a strongly growing base. Um, on August twenty second, uh, I think we'll have our completed NIST eight hundred fifty three variation of Kubernetes in a high performance computing environment within sort of HIP context. Um, and I think the way the world should think about this is this. So you build your cluster on-prem. When you decide you need to expand, and which always happens, right? There's like some research project that's due tomorrow, the paper must be finished. That's when you consume cloud resources. In that moment, you spend for like spot instances or whatever you want to do, and you grab them, you finish your research, shut them down, 
and that's the end of your cloud deployment. To be clear, that, doesn't, that, that does not obviate things like DR systems and clinical systems and, you know, and systems that have to run on a regular basis and also you, know, you might want to do fast prototyping in the cloud, but to run your cloud problems, to run your problems at full capacity on the cloud is a mistake. And go look at how Dropbox rebuilt their data centers to know that. Um, lots of people need to be acknowledged. Uh, I will, you know, I'll let the picture show up here for a second, so if they ever want to know, I work for really fancy people, and lots of people fund this, and lots of people help. Um, and here's the part that I want to do. Uh, so we have two data science positions that are open. We are trying to save the world, one small research computing problem at a time. And I'm told you guys have the best data scientists in the land. Please come and work with us. So, Vaughn, you gotta come work for Berkeley. And if you work for UCSF, you can go work for it. It's better that way, right? <laughs> um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Uh, what's your what's your network stack? Digital network switches routers. What are possible challenges you are, you have? Oh yeah. Have there? That is a super great question. So in the high performance computing world, uh, I think it's Lawrence Livermore actually put out the, some research on how they're losing something like eighteen to twenty five percent performance with their Kubernetes equivalent implementation, and most of that's falling apart at the SDN layer. So we are a Calico implementation at UCSF. Um, there are many different players in that space from you know, Flannel to Weaveworks and Calico and a bunch of others. Um, it turns out there is, a, there is an open question about whether high performance computing should be operating in a Kubernetes environment as it stands today. I don't think that question will forever be open, but I think it will be solved. Um, down at the base layer, we, are, we have host networks that, that are physically connected. In fact, you asked a question that has enough attached to it so we run Alice, the cluster that we have right now where we're messing with things, we run all of our storage, uh, which runs against something really cool called Rook, which is an implementation of Ceph against Kubernetes, which is pretty nerdy, but there you go. Um, but that host network is where we do the, the storage transit. Everything that happens between sort of containerized workloads is taking place at that software defined network. Does that help? Uh, yeah, and what was, was the hardware in your for your yeah, I should, should give a shout out to Intel. Uh, Intel gave us a slew of, uh, of fancy one new boxes. I think I, I even have them listed somewhere. Uh, we have a, okay, so I'll give, you, I'll give you three different variations, very simple. We're running some virtual servers to test to see whether we can just, you know, drop in virtualized boxes and expand our cluster on demand. We're using a, maybe 10, like, surprisingly large and complicated Intel clusters that we should have got, like, 48 uh, actual cores sitting on them, some fancy Xeon processors that can give you more details if you wanted them. Um, and then we have a slew of sort of, I, I think NVIDIA makes this illegal, but uh, I think we're running a bunch of GPU hardware that maybe NVIDIA wouldn't be happy about. Um, but that's how we're sort of expanding the thing. So it's a very hybrid and off of game setup to be fair. Do you have an AI sandbox? And if so, would you put it in this, or where would you? what would you do with that? Uh, yeah. In fact, we do. Like, that, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so the reason why we're, we're turning out to be more of a Kubernetes shop than the, the classic HPC world is because some of the data science tooling that is kind of critical involves actually looking at applications that are being hosted that have a need for strong compute in the background. Um, so like a, like, a single, like, a, like a classic HPC storm implementation would make that very hard. Um, so yeah, we are exposing namespaces that can host uh, sandboxes sort of on the end as you can. Thank you. I won't put it in front of Okay, thank you very much. So we ordered some kiwi. And it can get up here on its own. I think it's coming. And this is uh, Sasha, who's going to be giving our uh, third presentation. Do you have slides in? I just don't have actually something in the so when the robot arrives with his laptop, they'll play it. Thank you everyone for being here. Really appreciate it. Sorry, we were a little bit late at a meeting that was unscheduled. 
But I'm really excited to be here and share all the magic that we can build with Kiwi. And this is actually the Kiwi Box, our humble little delivery robot that delivers food all over Berkeley and soon Stafford and other locations. So it's really, really exciting stuff. And inside we have my computer. So on the computer, we'll play the story of Kiwi. And there's actually a really, really cool story behind Kiwi. So I'm really excited to share with you. So as we're setting this up, maybe a raise of hands. Who has heard of Kiwi before? Ooh, nice. Who has ordered with Kiwi before? Nice, nice. Some people. Who has been picked by Kiwi? We need to change the input or something. What do you do? Did, did I steal the input? Oh, there's no HDMI cable this way. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, should be loaded just right now. But what you're seeing right now on the screen is the future of cities. Kiwi's mission is to build the operating system of the city. And that's a pretty broad statement, but if you think about it, our cities right now are structured around cars, around parking, around a lot of infrastructure. It's pretty legacy. It's not something that people want to see in their cities as much moving forwards. We definitely see a city that is more made for people, that is made for living. And that's where robots come in. So about two years ago, we started deploying these robots in Berkeley, and since then we've had over 40,000 orders. And we built over 150 robots to do that. It's really incredible is to see how people adapt their lifestyles to accommodate more robots in their environment. So since we launched, we've had three generations, and we've seen a transformation in the way Berkeley approaches robots. So when we first launched, people were kind of hesitant, like, what is this thing? What does it do? Is it going to take my job? And quickly, a few people realize that actually it's there to help people, it's there to empower communities with deliveries that are more affordable and accessible. Early on, we had this optic, we had this idea that we're going to fully replace people, we're going to fully automate things. But after building a robot that was largely autonomous, our second generation was actually 99% autonomous, we realized that even though we're able to build an autonomous robot, it's actually not the answer for what our cities need. Instead, we decided to build a robot with parallel autonomy. This means that the robots are actually helping people instead of replacing them. And this has allowed us to build a model that scales to hundreds of orders a day. In fact, last semester, we had over 18,000 orders and over 2,800 unique clients in Berkeley who ordered. It's like almost 10% of the student population, which is pretty incredible. And over here on the screen, we can actually see the story of a day of operations. And it's really beautiful because you see robotics meshing within the fabric of our sidewalks and within our communities. The blue lines are actually robots roaming around, and the yellow lines are people. So people, you might ask, that's a great question. Why are there people involved in the mix? Well, that's because we found that, generally speaking, it's more efficient to have people that are helped by robots than to just have robots or just have people. So what you're seeing here is people in yellow so these are people who are going to restaurants, they're picking up food. These people are delivering it to clusters. Once the food is in a cluster, they feed robots, and then the robots do the last few hundred feet, the last few blocks to your doorstep. This way, instead of doing maybe one or two deliveries an hour, as a DoorDash or Uber Eats driver would do, our couriers do 15, which is a significant improvement. And that's why we're able to offer free delivery with Kiwi Prime. You subscribe to Kiwi Prime, and you can order as much as you want to anywhere in Berkeley. And some people really use it a lot. We've had some people who order more than 300 times in a semester. And our top 50 users, they order more than 15 times a week. It's more than twice a day. So it's pretty crazy stats. So where does the cloud come in to play here? Um, just about everywhere. <laughs> so these robots, they're actually fully connected to driving cloud extensions. I guess. Like, we have uh, a Jetson inside, so it's a uh, computer that has a really powerful GPU on board, lots of video RAM, but it's always communicating with the cloud. And we actually have a, a couple of different points uh, of presence on the cloud. We have stuff that's running on Heroku, for example. So we have probably like 
50 different services on Heroku, some of them ranging for interfaces with the robot, others are more to do with ordering, customer service, with integrations with restaurants. We also have other cloud platforms that we're using. So for example, we're using uh, Google's cloud platform for routing, uh, we're using them for storage as well, and also other services like AWS, it's kind of a, a mix of different services, uh, so it's sort of what the developer wants to do, that's what they choose. Uh, in addition to these services that provide us our, our hosting, our compute, our storage, we also use some other cloud services. I guess maybe it's going beyond the traditional stretch of imagination of what you call a cloud service, but we use Workplace by Facebook, we use um, this really cool tool called Node, which is where we're using, running this analysis right now. and. Um, Prior to this, we actually had a couple of different data platforms that we built, but they were all like Jupyter Notebooks, it was like really difficult to use. And then we went onto this one, and we have these really, really beautiful visualizations that help us um, understand what's happening with the Kiwi, what's happening with our operations, and they don't require any technical knowledge, so people can use them from a more business background or more product background. So it's, it's a much better approach to doing data analysis. <coughs> Um, where else do we use the cloud? Yeah, I mean, this would not be possible without the cloud. is always connected to 4G, so we always have people who are supervising the robot, has a persistent 4G connection, has redundant connections, actually. Um, so it wouldn't be possible to build this without the cloud. Yeah. Any questions? No questions? Am I that boring? <laughs> yes. Your robot depends on 4G connectivity to the cloud. What happens if the, the cell phone modem or the pen dies or whatever is interesting? What then? Does that become a break or does it do its last piece of command that delivery or something? That's a great question. So, in case, uh, just repeat the question so we have it uh, here. The question was what happens if we lose 4G connectivity? It's a fantastic question. Um, so, typically, what happens is that we do lose 4G connectivity from time to time. And that is a challenge, because if we lose connectivity and the robot does not connect again to 4G, we would have to dispatch a person to restart the robot manually. Fortunately, it doesn't happen too often, so that's not that much of an issue. However, we do have some areas in Berkeley where we have a lot of latency. So what we recently started to do is we started to pull all of our latency data from our database, and we started to analyze it. And recently what we did was we actually published a map which shows us where in Berkeley we have high latency. So we're actually able to merge that map with another map we have, which shows the dangerous parts of Berkeley. So we have like certain streets where it's like, you know, it's a little too tight with cars, it's a like construction zones. Uh, so we actually uh, combine these two maps together, and now we have a map that tells our supervisors where it's safe for the robot to go based on the latency, based on road conditions. So, yeah. But connectivity is probably our number one issue. Yes. What is the uh, interface to the, the people side of this on the yellow? I mean, are they getting phone calls from somebody, or is it all kind of automated as well? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's probably where most of our magic is, because for us, it's not about building the best robot. It's about building the best experience for the customer. At the end of the day, we're offering a commercial service that allows you to order food. And you as a user, you just want to order food with your app, and you just want food. You don't care about the robotics. You don't care about all that stuff behind. There's actually a lot of magic. Actually, that goes uh, behind. So we have a lot of internal tools that help us uh, make that delivery possible. For the robot specifically, we have a couple of interfaces. We have like a God Mode interface where we can see all the robots. Um, we use this tool called Free Robotics, and that has like a dashboard of all of the robots, like their state, like uh, are they working, are they charged, uh, do they have any faults. And also for the supervision of the robot, we actually have a supervisor interface where people set waypoints for the robot to follow, and then the robot follows these waypoints autonomously. Any more questions? Yes. So I was just wondering about, I mean, we've heard about flying scooters being thrown in the Lake Merritt and like rage directed at technology. <laughs> and um, do you have problems with that with the Kiwi bots and is there a monitoring to just make sure they're not being vandalized or abused? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So we've been very fortunate in that with the onset of Kiwi, we're always understanding what's happening around us. We're always trying to analyze the market. We're always trying to see how people react, like look at what people say on social media, look at how people react to a robot next to, while standing next to it. 
And what we found is that adding a face to a robot actually really helps us a lot. So once we added the face, people started seeing it more as a friend rather than a foe. Actually, with the very first generation, it was literally a shopping basket on wheels. So <laughs> uh, I might have a video of that somewhere. This is the very first cutie bot. That's what it looked like. Uh, so it was literally a shopping basket on an RC car, and it would, had a Raspberry Pi inside, an Arduino, it had a phone that was doing a video call uh, off to somebody who was controlling with like an Xbox controller. So it was very, very basic. Um, and it worked so badly that most of the time we just dropped it off in front of the customer's doorstep. <laughs> 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 So with this one, we did have some issues. People were messing around with it. Uh, but then we quickly went on to a second generation. We actually adopted an organic shape. So we had a, a really round shape, really friendly. We actually built it uh, in this penthouse in the harbor room over there. So Gordon really loved us during that time. And um, yeah, it was a cool experience. We realized that actually having a face makes it friendlier. We adopted this kawaii. Uh, style of design, which people really love and associate well with, and um, yeah, we've had people who try to steal it, but nobody got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Similarly, yes. so, uh, how do you keep people from stealing stuff out of it? Well, we actually have a locking mechanism here, so you'd have to apply like a lot of force to open the door. Um, and it got to the point where now it's actually cheaper for us to replace the food than to put in any more sophisticated locking mechanisms. <laughs> uh, so it's. Incidents of like people stealing food are very very low. Maybe happens once or twice a month or something like that. So it's a very rare occurrence, and it actually costs less for us to uh, have the system as it is right now than to upgrade it. Yes. Have you considered placing this in, uh, you know, in, like downtown San Francisco? I wonder how it would fare. Yeah. <laughs> I actually brought the robot once to downtown San Francisco, uh, and people love it. I, there was this one person uh, who started changing themselves. They were using this like as a Thing to hold their clothes. <laughs> so, that was on Market Street. Um, <laughs> I, I think right now our model is more centered toward campuses because the college campuses we have a really friendly environment, a lot of people who are really keen to try robots and have an open mind and open heart. Uh, with cities we have a lot more different types of personalities that we have to handle and also it's a question of cost because right now we're operating the robot at about $4.6 an hour we'd have to make sure we're able to scale our business model to cities, and I don't think we're ready yet. We'd have to reach more like the $2 target before we're able to deploy that into cities. So do you have like statistics, how many of these get hit by a car, by a truck, how many of these get you know, hit by people and into the lake, or do you have some statistics like that? Well, we fortunately have I, I, I never did kick one into the lake, though. <laughs> I, I do know of someone. Yeah. Well, we've never had any robots in the lake yet, so I'm really thankful for that. Uh, we do have minor bumps and scratches that happen with the robots. We don't necessarily have statistics for that, as we don't track that very closely. We get some emails from time to time with like really angry people, but then like we bring them over to our office, we show them what they're doing, or we like, explain to them what we're building, we give them a plushie, and they walk away happy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we haven't had that many issues with that. Berkeley is really welcoming of what we're building, and it's actually the very first time in the world that we've seen a community adopt a robot. Like, if you walk around Berkeley, you'll see people helping out robots. If a robot gets stuck in a pothole or falls on the side of a sidewalk, somebody will come and rescue it within seconds. So it's truly incredible to see a robot in the community. Yes? Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, do the sidewalks ever get too crowded at the lunch hour, say, the robot to move? Because they're not as cut out. Yeah, and we're actually solving this right now. We're making the robot far more agile, so we have a new version that's coming out really soon, and I'm excited to share the news with you, but I can't quite yet, but it'll actually solve this problem specifically. Yes? Are you getting challenges from government entities and reading different municipal codes? So at first, yes, uh, because when we started rolling around in Berkeley, we had no permit, we had no permission, uh, but we actually built up a relationship, and now we have a really good relationship with the university. They invested into us through Skydeck, uh, so that's going great in Berkeley. And we actually, when we initially went to other campuses, we uh, did a trial uh, in UCLA and a trial in Stanford, and what we found is that actually it wasn't the 
municipal code or any regulation that was a challenge, it was communication. We needed to communicate clearly our plans of what we wanted to do. And so once we had that on paper, once the local authorities could say, oh, okay, we actually understand what they're doing, then they were happy with it. Another example was San Jose. So San Jose was, um, just trying to think of the right word, um, overtaken by scooters at one point. And there were like several scooter companies that just like dumped their scooters everywhere to the point where San Jose had to hire a person, like they had to hire extra resources to manage all these scooters. And they were really frustrated because nobody approached them uh, telling them what's gonna happen, what the scooters are, how they're gonna be used. And when Kiwi approached them, they were like, oh hey, that's so bizarre. We didn't expect a company like yours to approach us. And we're really excited to work with you because now we can actually build something together instead of like trying to pose uh, with each other. So for us, it's been a more pragmatic approach now. Yes? Um, so how do you handle, I guess, like obstructions that occur that are not mapped? Does the robot send some information back up that then the other robots can pull down and understand that there's a obstruction on the sidewalk? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you may be over-imagining how automated this robot is. <laughs> <laughs> for the most part, it's just people who are sitting behind a laptop and setting waypoints for the robot okay. to follow. So they typically see a video stream of the robot and an overlay of sensor data. So they can see like, if there's any obstacles, any people, if it has a risk of like, colliding with something on the side or if it's about to fall off. So it's just like an augmented video feed where they click uh, for the robot to go to. So the supervisor would actually see if there was an obstruction, they would uh, navigate around it. So I saw near the Starbucks here one time, the robot was just following people annoyingly, and they would, the person would get into, the room, in, into Starbucks and it would start following another one. So somebody was doing that. <laughs> just making it good. Yeah, I haven't heard that before, but that's a pretty funny yeah. <laughs> Yes. How many people does each controller, how many robots does each controller control? Typically three. But we're pushing that up. We're expecting to have more uh, as we improve the automation, as we improve uh, how smoothly it performs. We definitely expect to have more, more people, uh, more and more robots uh, supervised by each person. Some questions here? Yes. I think a related question was: yeah. uh, Is it how is it navigating? So there's no online that is map that it's following. Is it all related to the waypoints that the supervisor sets? Pretty much, yeah. We actually have a map, as I explained earlier, with the um, latency and the dangerous areas. Okay. But that just is more of like a pointer. So the supervisors can see the map, and they can see the robot on the map. But ultimately, they make the decisions. However, we do have sensors on board the robot, so they can detect whether it's about to fall off. Uh, we also use object detection, so we detect people, cars, bikes, and all sorts of different objects. Um, so it's very intelligent in that approach. And it's a very pragmatic approach. Because at first we're like, oh, okay, we're going to uh, build a neural network that does intersegmentation, and then we can plot paths, and we can do all this routing. And it turns out it's possible, but it's actually only 99% reliable. So what ends up happening is that once you're crossing 10,000 intersections a week, as we were doing last year, now we're doing more, you still have like 100 collisions or 100 problems if you're at 99% accuracy. So you cannot have that 99% accuracy. You have to achieve higher for a job for a commercial service. Yes, in the back. So today is food delivery. What's the future? It's a great question. I mean, you can imagine a lot of things. I think long term, what we'll see is probably like an API for delivery. Today we have an internet that allows us to communicate between anybody in the world. But it's limited to bits. You know, you can send information to it. But what if you want to send atoms? What we're building is the internet of atoms, the physical layer for a city. And this, if we deliver a robot, is just the first step. Yes? Um, have the communities that you work with, the campuses, the cities, have they ever asked you for data back, for example, for the busiest uh, streets, the busiest walkways, the easiest paths to take? It seems like city planners could use that. It seems like people who are interested in like helping the disabled, like people in wheelchairs, that they could somehow benefit from all that data. 
Yeah, surprisingly, we haven't had too many uh, governments or officials reach out to us for this kind of data. Uh, with our advisors, we're speaking about what kind of data we have available. Probably the most interesting data set is uh, cell coverage and latency maps. We were strongly advised against sharing that because that could endanger our relationship with our carriers. Because uh, then they'll say, like, oh, these government officials are really getting this data from us. Like, oh, it's Kiwi. It's, wait, we're, we're providing Kiwi services. Uh, why should we continue working with them? So it's kind of like a, a tricky game you have to figure out. Um, but we haven't been strictly approached for the kind of data you were talking about. Any more questions? Yes, sorry. How did you actually know when to cross the road? That's a good question. <laughs> Traffic signals. Yeah. yeah, so when we first started building the robot, we built a, a machine learning algorithm that tried to detect uh, the traffic light, and we did not quite get it accurate enough. So even though we were able to detect most of the time the color of the signal, um, it was not accurate enough for us. So now instead what we do is we detect the traffic light, which is super accurate. We can 100% detect the traffic light, and then the person actually judges what color it is. So it's like super zoomed in and they can actually see. So will uh, a supervisor is turned over, but you can cross the road mm -hmm. now. Yep. Yes. So uh, two linked questions. How large is your engineering team? And when you were talking about vendor selection around cloud services, I believe you said that it's up to just the developer and what they know or want to do. Is that uh, true? And is that your longer term plan? Or where do you see it evolving as you scale? Uh, some great questions. So to answer the first one, we have 48 people in Kiwi. Um, our engineering team. Oh, okay, so we have like AI and robotics team, which is like seven-ish people. We have um, like a, a back-end team, which is five-ish people. Uh, we have a mobile apps team, which is like a couple more people. We have a product team, which is five people. Um, so something like that. <laughs> That's our uh, engineering uh, team. In terms of choosing cloud providers, it's more about like how quickly you can ship a product, how quickly you can get something out the door. Um, so developers, they're typically saying like, okay, how can I get this out as quickly as possible? So they're just going for the easiest solution. Because uh, for us, it's really important to try things. So for us, it's more important to try something and see how quickly we can fail it rather than to build the perfect solution. For some systems, we we're actually starting to see that, okay, we've done this a lot, we uh, know that we need to use the system, so some of the early systems that we built, we we're rebuilding them. And um, we're trying to standardize around Heroku, which is running on AWS, because the deployment and the management and the metrics are super straightforward, super simple. It's a little on the expensive side, but for now it's serving our needs pretty well. So most of our backend code is running on Heroku and some things, like for example, we have our own OSRM server that's running on AWS because we can to figure out how to run it on Heroku. So, yeah. I think I had a question in the back there somewhere. Yeah. No yes. Uh, you said you started with the Arduino and then you moved up to the Jetson. Yeah. And just a question, does the, does the robot push the limits of the Jetson hardware or do you still see that there's still more space for the robot to improve? Yeah, I love that question. And we definitely push the limits of the robot. We develop a lot of features that marginally improve the performance of the robot, but we actually cannot include them in final releases for the robot because they use too much CPU. So we definitely do hit the limits. And I think the next question is, is our code optimized? And the answer is definitely no. Uh, so I think the, the reason why we hit the limits is because we're not optimizing our code. But I think it's a really good constraint to have because we're actually able to ship a, a unit of functioning code that is able to run on a mobile device. Uh, so that's, that's probably the most important part. Yes? Um, so these have cameras on them, and you guys are retrieving video data from them. Do you store that data? Or that's a great question, and actually the question we get a lot. So we do not store this raw data anywhere. Uh, however, we do process it, and we also do stream it for the supervisors who are monitoring the robots. Yes? Do they have a microphone? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last question we can wrap up. It's already yeah. six thirty. Uh, feel free to mingle afterwards, but maybe another hand for it. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs>